what do you think about the internal management thing? I don't think anything about it. I barely know anything about it. M anybody talking about it probably don't know really anything about it. Maybe you can specify more what you mean about this. It's a very broad thing. It's like, what do you? What is your opinion about the sky? I don't know. I'm opinionless about the sky. It's a sky. Like, I don't know. W you need to be more precise. There's a lot of backlash because it can't be removed or turned off without the CPU not working anymore and you can basically control the whole computer. So, <laughs> I don't know the problem. Like the thing is, I understand, the, my criticism is that it's not fully kind of like explained. You know, it's a product that you buy that has features that are not well documented. That's my biggest issue I guess I have with that. But once it's properly once it would be probably documented I wouldn't have a like my problem is with lack of documentation with, because it gives us lack of understanding but once we better would understand it then you know I don't have any opinion about it you can it's obviously an, a problem when unauthenticated people can somehow make use of it but if it requires uh, low level hardware access already or uh, physical access or internal network access that seems to be a uh, you know, very deep inside already. I don't really care about that. I have the issue that my issue about the kind of discussion about Intel ME is about what are the requirements for these exploits? And by, oh wait, that, that's basically my whole point. What is the requirements of these exploits? Because, you know, exploitability and likelihood and, and risk comes with how exposed are you actually? Clearly, it's not like you can take over immediately the world because this hasn't happened. And there's a lot of marketing going on. Like the companies that do research into this obviously blow this up in media like hell and in their talks and are very kind of like unclear about the requirements for the exploitability. There's sometimes like a network component, sometimes there's never com like I don't e understand, like, you know. So not only is Intel ME undocumented, the exploits about it are undocumented and it's annoying the hell out of it. Why can nobody just say the requirements for exploitability are this feature has to be enabled, it's enabled on these uh, CPUs, it's not enabled on this, it requires physical access, it requires code execution in rung, ring zero, it requires a local uh, network access. It re like I don't understand why this is not properly defined what the attack surface is. Because clearly the attack surface is not huge because clearly the stuff doesn't fall over immediately. Um, I don't know. Yes, it's established that ME has network stack correctly because it's like a management unit that you can remotely manage. But what does remotely manage mean? And, you know, I don't know. Like, so what? Network access is required for some exploits. Is the network access, does that work with any network card that you have in your machine or only with the network port that is directly, you know, on your motherboard connected to your, uh, uh, to your chip there? I don't know, like, does it affect, I don't even know, you know, does it affect, and an, if you have a 10 gig eth ethernet card in there, you know, is that, like all the servers that are running that have ex special uh, one gigabit, uh, 10 gigabit or even 100 gigabit ethernet cards are this, are these machines still affected? Is that somehow still kind of bridged through motherboard chips plus generic driver ones? But you you get the complexity, you know? This is like low level hardware stuff which with with a lot of if cases in front of if if it's exploitable. And I feel I'm let I feel let down by the people that have at least the research that I haven't fully studied it, obviously. But the research information and talks I've seen about this were all uh, wishy-washy and weren't really precise on what it is because they were fear-mongering and generally I'm a bit uh, always skeptical when, when they start like fear-mongering about vulnerabilities because clearly the apocalypse hasn't happened. You know, the world, we, we have more issues with Eternal Blue than we have with the crazy Intel ME and yeah. I do think it's a concern. It's a concern for the researchers and Intel, uh, you know, to concern about the research and Intel to make sure that this isn't crazily bad. It is a concern, but I don't think it's a concern for us general consumers. We shouldn't care about it. I saw a video about a chip that could replace a resistor and modify signals through it. 
yeah I know like you can make hardware pretty small who cares this is all theoretical attack surface you know like the trust and trust it's a like this uh, paper here it's it's good to mentally think about this you know to understand on what kind of trust levels we are built building upon but there and I love these thought experiments you know but there's always th this kind of hacking thing thought experiments I always have to be faced with the reality of real risks and there's way too much fear mongering happening. Sometimes I have a bit of a trouble to communicate this well because you know from my YouTube channel that I'm extremely passionate about the really obscure and esoteric hacks. You know, I love these weird browser quirks and bugs that we are finding and making videos about. These are so awesome. There are so little hacks, there's so much ingenuity into these small parts. And I love that. I can, you know, be ecstatic about this all day long. I love that. That's what my whole channel, YouTube channel is about. But we also have to admit that realistically, you know, the risk, meh, doesn't really matter. You know, phishing is the biggest problem we have. Phishing is probably the largest hacking issue we have. If I would go about real world impact, I would talk about phishing all day. But I don't really care what the real world impact is. I care more about the technical ingenuities, right? But that also means we must not fear monger because fear mongering should happen about phishing, I guess, <laughs> because this is what has actual impact. And then maybe once in a while, some kind of crazy eternal blue exploit or so that actually has some real world effects. But the, all the other stuff is, you know, chill down. Stop the fear mongering in IT security, I hate it. Most end users don't need to care about this. You know, let's deal with that kind of stuff internally. But that obviously clashes with the wish for marketing and exposure for companies. I believe our move forward in the industry has to somewhat be the path that also science has done. You know, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of scientists conducting research and in investing their whole lives into research but only a small part surfaces into uh, real world products and commercially viable products for for, um, uh, for consumers. But as a society, we still understand that this investment, this whole bottom of the iceberg that you don't see in science, the research is all important because that all helps us to get to that, you know, that one kind of fine thing that helps us society, humanity to move forward. And I think security will go there too. So so basically, you know, security like 10 years ago or still kind of now we are in this transition phase, I think now. Back then security impacts a single person could have can take down the whole internet or so, you know. That's kind of like the physics, science and chemistry of, you know, 100 years ago where a single person can have massive impacts on research of society. Nowadays, we transitioned in regular science away from that and uh, now science is done in, in the darks, you know, the most people don't really have to care about this anymore. And once in a while we have some great findings, but, but we still invest into this huge hidden iceberg of research. And I believe we are in a transition area in a, for IT security as well right now. And w so we, we have some clashing interests there. I believe in, in the move forward, we have more and more security issues and findings that are irrelevant for the public. They don't care. They are not as impactful as we want them to be, but they are important steps forward to still build, you know, IT, IT security research and stuff like this. And once in a while, something will pop out there, but it will be more contained in our society community, but th that clashes with the marketing wish and the publicity that our companies want with fear mongering and stuff like this. And it gets more and more embarrassing, like more and more fear mongering happens now with less and less impactful vulnerabilities. And it gets more and more embarrassing. And that's kind of an issue. That's what I, why I believe we are in kind of a transition area because we see more and more vulnerabilities hyped up where the impact is very little. That doesn't mean that I love them. I, I still love them. I think still think they are great, but it should be something that internally, you know, we discuss uh, like Rohammer, I think is a good example. Rohammer is such an amazing 
research finding. It's it's incredible. It's awesome. I I, I love that Rowhammer these hardware attacks so much, and they are incredibly important as a foundation for our research. But the general public doesn't have to care. But I also think, for example, Rowhammer, they have done their marketing fine. They have done written their papers, they have published their papers in scientific journals, they talked about at conferences about it. They do it correctly, but that's also because Rowhammer is coming out of academia already. You know, th these are people that are, have done that kind of research at universities. So so they do it already. Then on top of that, you might have, you know, news companies or other companies to piggyback on that research and then do a little bit of more fear mongering, some kind of marketing thing. But the research themselves, I think they have done it perfectly fine. I think that is a good example of how security research look should look like. Spectre meltdown, same thing. Um, great academic research. It was published as journals and papers and and you know um, made a website to explain it. Great, great way how to do it. And then journalists have piggybacked on top of it and have kind of blown it up a bit but it shouldn't it doesn't really matter for the consumer for most people it matters a lot for our security research community it matters a lot for the science behind it it doesn't matter really for uh, for the consumer does that make sense i don't know i feel like that's a topic i kind of want to make a video at some point over i just need to sort my thoughts a little bit more concisely and with some examples and stuff like this.